Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. Happy summer. We are in the midst of a series called Friends of the Family. And man, it's uh, kind of funny for me to be preaching in a series called Friends of the Family, where we're focusing on outside voices. But I consider myself to be Hope City's first friend. And so <laughs> here we are, you know. Uh, Tiffany and I were uh, one of the, the first friends here at Hope City. And so we've been so grateful for friends like Pastor Mark Alt. We're grateful for his voice and, and uh, his, his voice in our lives talking about how do we finish well. We talked to uh, or heard from Pastor Steve Kleckner uh, last week, and, and he talked about actually the power of community and how good it is to be in community with one another. And if you missed either one of those, I would highly encourage you, jump over to Hope City's app, get on YouTube, whatever it is, and, and re-watch or re-listen to those, those messages um, because they're just absolutely critical for us. But with school coming around the corner, we have a, uh, a serve day opportunity for us. We're going to be doing a, uh, a serve day opportunity. You heard Megan talk about that. That this summer we're partnering with families from Wilkinson Elementary School. Many of these families you guys serve on a monthly basis at our family uh, Saturday fun days throughout the school year. Uh, and we found out that we were able to help provide sneakers for kids to go back to school. And we know that actually providing a sneaker similar to this one is uh, it's, a, it's a way to help kids grow mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Now, how do, you, how do you figure all that stuff, right? Well, this is the tag that I pulled last week. It's a size uh, one and a half kid, uh, <laughs> size one and a half shoe. The kid is not one and a half size. Um, it's a size one and a half. It's for a boy. And man, I wanted, I wanted to get some Adidas like these guys because I thought, man, I would wear these. These look awesome. Even with the Velcro, I would wear these things. And so, um, you know, find yourself a tag and then uh, go and pick out some shoes for your kids. You're going to bring them back here. But here's how, here's how this impacts life, right? We said that there's nothing that changes you like putting on a new fresh pair of shoes when you start school. That changes your perspective of starting school, changes your confidence when you walk into the classroom and you walk in with a little bit more swagger, a little bit more confidence that I can do this. It's changing their mind. It's changing their emotions because guess what? They're going to be able to step in in a way that they feel proud of themselves. It's changing their physical body because they're going to be able to run around on the playground and they're going to have a great time there. And we believe it's changing them spiritually because the night that we're distributing these shoes, we're not only going to just distribute shoes, we're going to let them pick out their shoes, feed them dinner. We're going to provide opportunities to pray for them and walk alongside of these families, inviting them each and every month to Saturday fun days that you guys are a part of. And so I want to thank you for that. But don't forget to go out in the lobby afterwards. You saw the pegboard out there. It's got all these little tags on it. Go grab a couple tags or grab one tag and bring back those shoes in the next two weeks. But I've been thinking a lot about shoes, uh, this shoe rack or shoe tree over here and different shoes that you've had in your life. And I've got some shoes that I've had in my life that are no longer in my life. Uh, here's a pair that, that maybe I should have just held on to because they're almost back in style again, right? Um, I had a pair of foot cages just like this. Uh, they were the sweatiest things that I've ever owned in my life, but they were cool at the time. Uh, it was a pair of Doc Martens <laughs> and they, let me tell you something. The byproduct of wearing these Doc Martens was uh, incredible calves because they were about 900 pounds per sandal. And, and like it is it's as thick as you think it is. I was about seven foot tall when I would wear these shoes. And uh, surprisingly enough, when I started dating Tiffany, she was like, never again. Like, never, ever again. But... We were married at the time when this next pair of shoes rolled along, and it was too late for her. So um, I was a campus pastor. These were my campus pastor shoes, my campus pastor boots. I did a lot of life in these boots. Uh, I got them at Buckle. Anybody remember Buckle? Uh, I also had the embroidered back pockets to go with <laughs> those boots. And so uh, they weren't bedazzled. It was just thread. So, um, and then the, the shirt was also embroidered. And I loved these boots. Like, they had a zipper on the side, just easy to slip in and out of. And I thought that, man, they, they built confidence, even though I have never actually been a cowboy or ever even lived in Texas. But uh, they, were, they were some boots that brought me through some days. Somebody sent me these shoes this past week, and I thought, these could be in my future, right? Big these, these could be in my future. And uh, here's the reality. I don't even need to tell you what they are. 
You already know, like I'm by the grill right now. Like I'm, I'm by the grill, I've just mowed the lawn and I've probably got a roll of duct tape somewhere fixing something when you got these shoes on, right? Like get some Air Monarchs out, mix them with a croc and here we go, right? Like here we go. Um, these, these shoes tell a story and yours do too. Uh, these shoes I have on right now, I've had these shoes for years and I love them. They've, they've been with me for about eight years now, stood on platforms like this, uh, done hospital visits in these shoes, uh, you know, weddings, all kinds of things. These shoes have been with me through thick and through thin. Shoes represent a journey. And these shoes that you're purchasing for students will represent a journey for them as well. There will be a day when they look back and they said, you know, I never had such a cool pair of shoes as I did that year when I was in fourth grade. Or I never had the, the most incredible pair of shoes as I did then. And, and journeys change us. They, like shoes take us on a journey, but journeys also change us. Think about the journey of moving, right? Like you've moved. I, I know you have. You've stepped into a new area that's unfamiliar to you. Some of you have recently moved to Sarasota and you're like, whoa, this is, this is different. It is hot as all get out, right? Like this is, this is incredible. Um, you've stepped into new experiences that maybe there's local cuisine that you're saying, okay, I, that's different for me. Um, or there's different customs. And, and you say, since I've moved, I'm going to change. And we would say things like, hey, if the shoe fits, wear it, right? Like, so when you move, wear it. If the shoe fits, wear it. But something else changes you, and that's parenting. Any parents in the room? Raise your hand. If, if you Yes, you have changed. Like your kids have changed you, right? Get some kids involved in your life. You don't even need to be their parents, but care for them. And you're going to find out that they change you. There, there's different responsibilities that come out. There's different uh, priorities change. And also, guess what else changes? <laughs> your resources change. And see, as a parent, you now have big shoes to fill. And there's opportunities there. But there is nothing that will change you quite like the journey of going through a health crisis. When if you've ever had to walk through a health crisis, you know that it causes you to look at life a little bit differently. You start counting your steps. You start counting your days, and you're grateful for the days that you have. You start living life to the full. But it can leave you feeling like, when is the other shoe going to drop? Exactly. See, every day, every day we have the opportunity to be shaped by what's going on around us. This is why Paul writes to the Ephesians when he says this in, in chapter 5. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, God has given us wisdom to be able to walk through the world around us and see what God is teaching us. And as we walk through life, uh, we say things like, God, would you show us how to walk in wisdom? You ever thought about wisdom? And how do you get wisdom? See, this is what we're going to define wisdom as. Wisdom is taking what you know and putting it into action. Too many of us make wisdom this like enormous, like, I don't know if I could ever have it kind of thing. It's taking what you know putting it into action. It's living life skillfully. Like, that's the easiest way for me to, to kind of summarize this for you. A and it's like this, right? If you know that the stove produces an excessive amount of heat, and an excessive amount of heat, when applied to your skin, produces pain, wisdom says, do not touch a hot stove. Okay. Like, okay, now we're talking. Now we're living life skillfully. And here's what we need to know is that we should always be living life trying to gain wisdom. Because you can do one of two things. You can go through life or you can grow through life. And so we ask ourselves the question, God, what are you trying to teach me? And today, I want to give you a glimpse into my own life. Into my life saying, what is it that God has been been teaching me? What is God showing me? In fact, I want to invite you to walk a day in my shoes. See, you can consider this the confessions of a pastor maybe, but I've been asked by so many people like, what's it like to be a pastor? And you must have rock solid faith, right? Or you're so close to God. Well, maybe, but I'm a person just like you and I'm growing and learning too. And so here goes. <laughs> What am I learning from God, and what has God been teaching me, and where am I growing? Well, for the past three years, 
uh, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that God has been growing me and changing me. He's in a process of teaching me things that I've had to process with a counselor, I've processed with my wife, I've processed with my family, uh, I've processed through prayer, I've processed with friends. And I can break this down into three categories. That God is increasing my faith, that God is increasing my dependence, and that God is increasing my stamina. Three areas that your pastor is growing. See, I'm not, I'm not teaching, I'm not preaching today from a place of perfection, but actually from a place of brokenness. I'm not preaching from a place of having it all together, but actually from a place of process and, and learning. I know that I will not be fully developed, fully matured, until I'm standing before God one day in heaven, and where everything is made perfect in the presence of my Savior. But I do want to share with you, I do want to help point you to Jesus and help you become more like him in the ways that I have been, been growing. And, and so one of the things that, that God's been stretching in me and growing in me is, is my faith. And so here's, here's how we define faith. Faith is believing all that God says as being absolutely true, even though circumstances seem to be against its completion. So let's boil that down, right? Like, what does that even mean? It just means that faith is really hard, isn't it? Like, sometimes it is so hard to have faith. It's easy to say you have faith. It's another thing to live out your faith. So we have faith. We say we have faith in God's abilities, that God can do whatever it is that you're believing for him to do. But the question is, do we act like we have faith? See, it's easy to talk about faith when you're not under pressure or the strength of your faith when you're not under pressure. If you think about um, doing a squat press, right? So you've got a, a barbell on your shoulders and you're ready to dip lower than life itself and then come on back up out of that, that movement and your, your thighs are just like burning and you're saying, this is the worst thing known to man. Leg day is the worst thing known to man. We can all agree upon that. Um, but here's, what's, here's what I know to be true, is that when there is no weight on the barbell, you're like, Psh yeah, bring it on. Like, I can do this all day, every day. We'll start putting some plates on there, and then the pressure is applied, and you realize that this is harder than, than you actually think it is. In Luke chapter 8, verse 22 through 25, we find a story about Jesus' disciples. You're familiar with this story. It's fascinating. I've taught on this, um, but we're going to come back to this story today because there's a very important part of this story, an important part in my story as well. It would be so easy for the disciples to have faith in Jesus, right? After everything that they've seen. And yet, we find a story here that changes it. It says, one day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. Not a hard thing to imagine. First off, they're surrounded by, by water, you know, the, the Sea of Galilee. Um, but also, not a hard thing to imagine Jesus would say, hey, let's go over here, and that they would just follow suit. They would follow Jesus. Your head knowledge just says, yes, this makes sense. Now, in verse 23, as they sailed, he fell asleep, he being Jesus, and a squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. Now things are getting a little dicey, right? This isn't just a boat ride. This is now like one of those uh, cruise gone wrong videos on TikTok or Instagram where it's like there's deck chairs sliding across and like people running for their lives. In verse 24, it says, the disciples went and woke him saying, master, master, we're going to drown. You know what the disciples did? They determined that the next step in their journey was drowning, that they were going to die. That was what was going to happen next. And Jesus asked them a question that is incredibly challenging. Look here, it says, it says this, that he got up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided, and it all was calm. Incredible. That's a miracle. A lot of people like to talk about that. But today we're going to talk about this question. Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. He said, where is your faith? And, and this is interesting because up until this point in time, in Luke chapter 8, eight chapters up until this point, the story has been filled with Jesus doing miracles. Miracles like this, a miraculous provision of fish. They're out fishing, caught nothing. Jesus says, nets to the other side, and they've got more fish than they can even imagine. Pfft, mind blown. They watched as a man whose skin was peeling off his body with leprosy was healed and looked like, uh, you know, uh, brand new and perfect. They watched a man who was paralyzed, unable to walk, get up and walk away, healed. 
they witnessed powerful teaching. They saw a man who had a, a birth defect, with a man with a shriveled hand who, who just was able to use his hand as if nothing had ever happened. They saw a centurion's servant healed from, from a distance. They watched a, a, a boy that, would, that died be brought back to life. And they saw people forgiven of their sins. They witnessed storms in everybody else's life. And yet, in their own life, when a storm showed up, they were rocked to their core. See, it's been easy for the disciples till, till now. They've been on a cakewalk, right? Like they were the most popular person in all of Israel. They're with the it socialite, right? Like the rock star. But now they're afraid that they're going to go down with the ship. And Jesus says, where is your faith? You can read this in one of two ways. One is that where is the quantity of your faith? Like, where is your faith? Like, how much, where, what happened to your faith? Or you can read it of, where have you placed your faith? Like, where is your faith? As in the location and source of, source of your faith. It's true that it's easy to be strong for other people in their storms. Because you get to walk away from their storm. But when the storm is hovering over your life, it causes you to, to run to Jesus and to ask questions like, don't you care? We're going to drown. So here's what I'm learning. I'm learning that it's okay to wrestle with honest questions and still have an honest faith. The disciples did. They asked Jesus if he cared. And sometimes I think that our faith is in jeopardy when we fear that God went somewhere simply because our life is going nowhere, seemingly. It's like you're stuck and God has moved on or forgotten about you because if you're staying here, God still, he can't still be there. He must have moved on somewhere else. But can I tell you something? Like this is what I'm learning and I want you to learn this too. Challenges shouldn't shake your faith. They should strengthen it because a faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. A, a faith that's tested can be trusted. The times that you walk through pain and God shows up, it strengthens you to be able to walk through the next painful thing, knowing with confidence that God's going to show up. See, in the past three years, I've gone to God with my problems. Like, I have I've run. I have put on running shoes, and I've gone to the Lord and been like, God, don't you see my problems? Like, Lord, what about the church? Lord, what about the, the people? Lord, what about COVID? Lord, what about my family? Lord, what about the building? Lord, what about? Lord, and I just keep coming and asking God. And what I've been learning is that God's faithfulness to me is increasing faith inside of me. Dallas Theological Seminary had a massive financial problem back in the, the early 80s. And their board would ga gathered together, and they were praying over what their next step was going to be. And one of their board members has famously said now uh, a prayer. Uh, and he's quoting out of Psalm, uh, I think it's Psalm 50, if I remember correctly. But he's, he's talking about uh, this thing, and he says, God, your word says that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Would you go sell some of it? And it was like just a couple days later that a rancher walked into their offices and said, I just sold a whole bunch of, of cattle, and I'd love to, to tithe on that. Pastor Louis Giglio, more recent, tells the story of how the Passion Conference was um, bumping into a problem. Their, their budget was far beyond their means, and he wasn't sure how he was going to make it happen. And there were bills that were piling up, but not resources piling up. And he, he talks about in, in his book, uh, a man called his office and asked if he had gotten his letter yet. Pastor Louie kind of blew it off like, yeah, no, I haven't gotten your letter yet. I'll, I'll look for it, though. And the man just said, okay, yep, just left it at that. And then he goes back to his office and he realizes that that letter had been stuck on his desk underneath a, a pile of paperwork. And he, he opens that letter up and inside that letter is a check for the exact amount that the conference was, was missing to, to pay all of their bills. God had put that check on his desk already. It had been there for him sitting there the whole time. And he looks at that and he goes, man, God, you have been so faithful and you were always faithful. It wasn't to the last minute. You had already provided it. I just didn't have the eyes to see it. 
I wish that I could take the rest of the service to tell you all the miraculous ways that God has provided for our church. One day I will, I promise you. But I still find myself running to the Lord saying, God, don't you care? Like, where are you? And Jesus, I can hear his question in my mind of, where is your faith? Is your faith in your abilities, in your strength? Or is it in God? Is it in your strategy? Or is it in your Savior? And I'm learning and relearning that God may use my abilities, but he controls the outcome, not me. There's a song that I've been listening to nonstop. It's called More Than Able. Download it. Put it on blast in your car on the way home today. It says two lines that I want to share with you. It says, why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? And the second one is, who am I to deny what the Lord can do? I'm learning that I can't say no for God. That I shouldn't say no for God. That God is actually more powerful than I, than I even give him credit for. And I'm learning that my, my faith has to line up with my experience and that, that I'm going to encourage you today that maybe you feel like your faith is being tested in every way. But a tested faith can be trusted. You can have confidence in your faith because of your confidence in your Savior. That is not up to you. It's never been up to you. So I want to ask you, how, how is your faith? Or where is your faith? See, God's been also teaching me that in the midst of growing my faith and saying, God, I know you're going to do what you said you're going to do, even though I can't see how you're going to do it. God's also been teaching me about dependence. See, here, here's, here's what dependence is, that it's a growing process. I've been going through the Bible recap program uh, or the reading plan this year, and some of you have been doing that as well, and kudos to you guys are more than halfway there. But I found myself in the story of, of uh, the Israelites in Exodus, not because of Moses and not because of Pharaoh, but I was the hungry Israelite that was complaining. Remember in Exodus 16, it says that in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. <laughs> when we were in Egypt, we sat around pots of, of meat and ate all the food we wanted. In other words, we might have been in slavery, but man, we were full, right? Like I love being full. But you brought us out into this desert to starve us and the entire assembly to death. You're going to kill us because we're so hungry. You know, we might be free now, but we're hungry. Israel's in a bad spot, but God was going to take care of them. Look at what happens. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough food for that day. And I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. And on the sixth day, they're to prepare what they bring in. And that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. In other words, I'm going to provide every day for you, but there's a catch. You have to only gather what you need for that day. If you try and keep it, it's going to spoil. If I try and keep more for the next day, it's going to rot, except for the sixth day, the day before the Sabbath, or the day of rest, the gift from the Lord. God's saying, I'm going to provide for you in a way that's going to blow your mind, in a way that you can't even reproduce. See, God was growing the dependence of Israel on him. It wasn't what they could do or prepare or strategize. Manna proved that you can't work for it. You can't replicate it. It was completely dependent on God to provide it. God knew that the people, when they stepped into the promised land, that their eyes would go off of God and onto themselves. Like, man, we arrived. We've done something special here. We're pretty good. But he had to not only take them out of Egypt, he had to take Egypt out of their hearts. In the wilderness, God prepared them and taught them to depend on him day by day. And in your wilderness and in mine, God teaches us that he will be there for us every single day. He's going to show up and care for you and provide for you and sustain you. He's going to give you the strength that you need to make it through the day. And do you know that some days, for me, it is not just day by day. It's hour by hour that I have to depend on God. It's been like that. And what I've learned is that my vertical relationship with God impacts every horizontal relationship that I have, every horizontal um, possibility that I have, like anything that's in front of me. My dependence on God gives me the strength to do anything externally. And I want to I encourage you with this because dependence does not disappoint. When you depend on God, it doesn't disappoint because it's far greater than your self-reliance or independence. But here's the problem. When our stomachs are full, we 
kind of think that life is smooth sailing, and it's easy for us to think that we had something to do with it. But in the promised land, the struggle is going to be with independence. You know, when God called Tiffany and I to, to start Hope City Church, I knew it was going to be hard. We both did. We knew it was going to be tough. But I knew that he had called us to it. I prayed about it. I talked with people who loved us. I talked with people who would counsel us. And, and, and we went through training. And, and at the end of the day, we knew it was going to be risky and challenging. But God has been so faithful over these seven years. You know, in these shoes, these shoes have seen some incredible things that God has done. And I've just been putting one foot in front of the other. I've said it in the past, like, we're just going to do the next right thing. We're just going to keep increasing our dependence on him. And so let me ask you this question. As I think about dependence, what would it take for you to feel okay today? What is it going to require for you to feel like, okay, everything's okay, I'm good, we're all good? See, what you require to feel okay might reveal what you're depending on. And where is God trying to grow your dependence on him? Are there situations, are there seasons of life right now that you need to increase your dependence? As faith and dependence grow, so much your spiritual stamina. And this is, this is an area that God has been shaping me and molding me and proving himself to me. I've got a friend, uh, his name's John. Many of you know John. I joke with John because John is a runner. And here's what I mean. Uh, he's not only a runner, he's also an Alabama fan. And he would love nothing more for me to say than, than roll tide, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Um, yeah, he's, he's in the back excited about that. But I joke with him that, like, there's something off with him, right? Like, he's a runner, be- and it's weird because nobody's chasing him. Like, why are you running? Like, this is not like the zombie apocalypse. This isn't like World War Z where, like, if you don't make it, John, the rest of us all die. No, he's just out there running, like, in the middle of the heat, running, like, doing his thing, running. And I'm like, why? I do not understand this. But here is what a non-runner is learning about running the race that God has set in front of us. You ready for this? So simple. The finish line is a lot farther than we think it is. I think many of us were conditioned that it's just, he's little, oh God, I'm going to do that for you. Yes, it's going to be great. And he said, no, the finish line is way ahead. I've got things in front of you way ahead. I've got plans for you way ahead. And and Romans 5, 1 through 5 has been teaching me a lot about what God does in the middle of the race, the middle of the race, like right there where we are. It says this in 5 verse 1 and 2. It says, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Incredible. We love this. We've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Woo! Man, like this is like the day after Easter Sunday. We're living high on the hog. We are loving life. We are rejoicing. But it's the beginning of the race. Everything's good right there. You just had your power bar. You've had your Gatorade. You got your electrolytes. You're, you know, you're ready to go. You're feeling good and you're actually enjoying running. Like, weirdo. But then Paul, he, he shifts the tone and he says, it's not just that. It's not about the good times. Look at f- verse 3 through 5. We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering, we know that suffering produces perseverance. We know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. This is the race. We're going to rejoice in pain. We're going to rejoice in suffering. We're going to rejoice in the moments that try your faith in every way. We rejoice. How is this possible? Because Paul says it's not just about the hardship, it's about the purpose in pain. And I'm telling you, if I've learned anything, is that there is a purpose in pain. Because God, he doesn't necessarily cause the pain, but he loves you way too much to waste your pain. He is not going to waste that. He's going to shape that. He says you're going to be, you're going to grow in perseverance, and your perseverance is going to grow your character. 
Our world t- gets a lot of attention, gives a lot of attention to people that are successful. But do you know what get go- gets God's attention? Character. God's eyes notice character. And character produces hope, and hope doesn't disappoint. We rejoice in this because God's in the midst of this. And here's what I'm learning about stamina, and I want you to learn, is that spiritual stamina refuses to give up on God, even when we think he's given up on us. Whatever season of life you are walking through in this exact moment, you must must grow your stamina. Refuse to believe that God has left you. Refuse to believe that God has abandoned you or that he hasn't, uh, he's stepped away from you. That is, couldn't be further from the truth. My God said he will not leave me, he will not forsake me. My God said, I love you so much that I'm willing to send my son to die on the cross for you. He's not just flippantly saying, oh, you know what, I love Patty. For the most part. You know, I love Kelsey sometimes. I love Alex. I love Scott. As long as he's running sound. No. That is not in God's character. He is faithful to you. He will see you through it. He's going to walk with you. He desperately loves you. And it's not based on anything that you've ever done. I heard Richard Blackaby talking about the the seasons of life. And uh, I was there actually with Dean. We were sitting at a table listening to Dr. Richard Blackaby. And he was saying how easy it is to give up in the middle of winter. You know, as as a farmer, when you're like, man, nothing is changing. The ground is frozen over. It's it's awful, right? And you can put this analogy into your life. The places in your life that feel frozen, that feel like void from God's presence. And he said it's like this. He goes, and the incredible thing about the seasons is that in a matter of a weekend or a day, spring arrives. Now, we don't know what that is here in Florida. We just got summer. But you know the feeling when that that one night where the humidity turns off and you're like, throw open every window. It is 80 degrees out. Let us sit out on the back patio for all of eternity. Maybe even break out the hoodies. Let's go. Humidity doesn't last forever. Summer doesn't last forever. But neither does your winter. Spring comes. New growth pops up, and it's just a day away. Like, life is hard. I get it. We could swap hard life stories all day long. But God is growing you into the person that he's created you to be. He's he's strengthening things inside of you. And he's using your challenges, your pain, to produce perseverance. Your perseverance is producing character. Your character is producing hope. And hope doesn't disappoint. Our hope is in God. Your job is not to know the beginning or the end. It's to walk faithfully with him. And if you can focus on Christ, it's going to clarify everything else. So my question for you today is, what's Jesus growing in you? Like the journey that you're on, the steps you've taken, the shoes you're in, where are you growing? I bared my soul to you. I'm growing in faith. Not that I didn't have it. But boy, my faith is multiplied in my Savior. I'm growing in dependence. Completely dependent on God. I can't do this on my own. And in stamina, I'm not giving up. I'm not going away. God, you got too big a mission. You got too many things here. What's God calling you to to grow? Maybe he's growing your worship. That you're showing up early, having worshiped on your way into church. Not just getting started in the first one. All right, Matt, warm us up. Let's go. I'll worship maybe by the time I get to the third song. No, no, no. 
We're going to start before we get here. Maybe you're growing in worship. Maybe you're growing in prayer. You're saying, God, I'm going to take next steps in, in bringing the things that are on my heart, my mind, that are heavy, that I'm going to, I'm going to bring them before you and I'm going to pray over them. Maybe he's growing your generosity. God, I'm, I want to be a generous person. Help me. Give me opportunities. Maybe he's growing your concern for others. That actually when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, it's challenging you to love your neighbor. Whatever it is, keep your mind and your eyes on Christ. He's going to walk with you through it. You know, today I know uh, several of you have already received communion. And I'm glad you did. At Hope City, uh, we practice open communion, and meaning that if you're a follower of Jesus, you can receive communion at any time. They're always down front here on my right and my left. But today I thought it appropriate to conclude our service by directing our eyes back on Jesus. The ways and places that he's growing inside of us begins at the cross. And at communion, we celebrate what Jesus did with his disciples at, at the Last Supper. When he said, he took a loaf of bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And we do that with, with a wafer. And when you eat that wafer, you remember Jesus' body that was broken for you. And in, in that cup there, there's a little bit of juice. And that juice is representative of Jesus' blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. It all starts with Jesus. It all ends with Jesus. And so today I want to invite you to receive communion as a way of remembering that and focusing 